Welcome everyone to the Rise of RevOps, aligning your teams around revenue excellence. Today, I'm extremely excited to be joined by my guests to talk about revenue excellence and how it ties to revenue operations and decision-making. I'm joined today by Sarah Hulian, VP of Revenue Excellence at Clary, and Corinne Singh, partner at Sapphire Ventures. Sarah, I'd love to just start with you and your current role at Clary. Let's lay out what revenue excellence is within your org, how it ties to revenue operations, marketing operations, and general operational excellence. And so at Clary, what we decided to do was bring together a bunch of different functions that traditionally live amongst different teams, bring them under one umbrella. Uh, and we did that because we look at all of our revenue critical employees, not just our AEs. We look at our sales dev team, our account executives, our sales engineers, our account managers, our CSMs. And we wanted to make sure that they had everything that they need to do their jobs, right? The focus that they need. Where should they, you know, what accounts should they focus on? What are the high propensity accounts? Where are the opportunities in the pipeline? The knowledge that they need. What's going on with our products? What's the content that's out there in the market? The assets that they need to then take that story to their customers, but also the skills as well too, right? Are they doing effective discovery? Are they able to negotiate? And really taking that holistic view of what they need to know to go from finding and creating pipeline to working and closing opportunities uh, to also renewing, growing, upselling, and showing value to our customers. So we saw a lot of value in bringing all of those functions together under a common umbrella to make sure that we're really keeping the focus on efficient and effective revenue generation and retention for our company. So it's been really fun to see how that comes to life. Um, and then to your question around how do we work with RevOps, with marketing ops, with other teams, they are our best friends. We work with them all the time. And if you think about the kind of the Venn diagram of what our RevOps team does versus the Revenue Excellence team, there is so much that RevOps does that we do not do. Territory planning, compensation planning, you know, all of the kind of administration of our Salesforce instance, for example, working through Clary, there's a lot that we work on together. Analyzing our pipeline, seeing what the high propensity to buy accounts are. And as our team scales up, we've been able to take a lot of the work off of their plates as well around things like account tiering, um, building out pipe gen targets by different audiences for our sales dev team, for our um, account executives, and also our account strategy and account planning documents to make sure that we really know how we are going to go attack pipeline throughout the year and how to rally our cross-functional team. Corinne? Uh, you're a partner over at Sapphire Ventures. Um, what does revenue excellence look like over at Sapphire? What are some of the top things that you're trying to tackle right now? Yep. Actually, funny enough, so Sapphire is a VC firm. So we invest in great companies like Clary and Qualified. Um, but there's a lot of commonalities, even though I'm more at the, again, my my set of companies, there's 75 to 100 that I'm supporting versus just one. But there are a lot of commonalities. Before I even speak to what revenue excellence is at Sapphire, I'll just say, I remember early days, I, I'm an ex-operator, so I was a VP of revenue operations at Procore, Cloudera previously. Early days at Cloudera, actually, we called the same thing revenue strategy, whatever that meant, right? Revenue strategy is somewhat ephemeral, but the, the way that we articulated, or at least my leader at that point articulated it to me was, hey, look, we have this customer journey, this prospect journey in place. We think we have some of it right. We probably don't have all the pieces figured out. There's not great continuity. There's probably some friction in the sales motion. Go in, find the areas of opportunity, evolve them, remediate them, get them to a point where you're in that maintain mode, not in build mode, and then be able to pass it off to the revenue operations counterpart. So I just, as you, Sarah, brought up some of the same, it, it kind of took me a little bit back to that moment at Cloudera. And it was, by the way, super meaningful even back then as we were going through that public event. And actually a good, um, a good translation to what I do at Sapphire as well. So as you said, partner at Sapphire Ventures, running a revenue excellence function. So Sapphire, for example, has invested in a slew of operators like myself to join the company, as well, uh, join the VC firm, and um, really take the learnings that we get from our broader portfolio. So I have, again, 75 to 100 companies like Clary, like Qualified, where I'm learning, what are you folks doing well? What are some best practices? Bringing in an external network of the best and brightest as well, learning from them connecting all these individuals together so you can share perspectives and then isolating those benchmarks, those best practices, and then again, sort of pollinating that across the portfolio, ultimately with the same goal, which is most companies have the same challenges, the same areas of opportunity, right? Within their funnel, within their customer journey, their motion. Can we isolate the ones that keep coming up, 
and share an external perspective, a third party perspective from X operators that have also been able to go deeper in individual companies and almost in a way partner with folks like yourself in the revenue excellence side so that you know, you're not doing it alone and you're not just doing it within an insular, within a company, but rather with others as well. Sarah, a big component of revenue excellence is building a holistic 360 degree view of the organization. Um, as you kind of approach that and you've honed in, you've built that high level, you know, 360 degree comprehensive view, how has that really helped accelerate the go-to-market teams, marketing teams, sales teams um, achieve their goals? Well, I think one of the things you mentioned this a little bit, I'm really fortunate to be working at a company like Clary where we do this because we have great visibility into what's happening in our business um, through the product that we sell. We use it ourselves, right? So we're able to see what's happening at every stage in the funnel, where pipeline is dropping off, where it's converting, um, get really deep in the analytics, see AI around what's trending in terms of opportunity scores. We're, we're able to be really prescriptive. But because we have so much data at our fingertips, one of the things that we've really been able um, to bring to the organization is focus, right? If you can look at every opportunity from every different angle, how do you boil that up into something that is giving you scalable insights into your organization and scalable insights into things that you can apply to the rest of the teams and the rest of the company? So a lot of what we have done is looking for trends and what's happening in our business, looking for pockets of success that we can capitalize on, repeat and scale to other teams. Like let's say there's something that's working really well in our commercial segment. How do we capitalize on that? Can we bring that to our enterprise segment? Can we bring that to our EMEA teams, for example? So really aligning not just on, hey, look, we have all this great data and we can use it and we can look at it. What is it telling us? What are the insights that we're seeing there? and then the action that we want to drive. So a, a big um, shift that we've been navigating to is bringing together a lot of the cross-functional teams who have a stake in driving pipeline or closing pipelines and organizing them around proactive actions we can take. So for example, you know, we started our monthly pipeline councils, which is most companies do them. Uh, we aren't just reviewing what's happening in the business. But we're having our growth marketing team, our events team, our content team, our product marketing team on those calls as well to say, here is the performance of what we are doing and how that's contributing to pipeline. And here's what we will be doing based on what we all talked about today. A lot of actually what we're trying to bring people together to do is discuss like, hey, I found this opportunity. This thing was yeah. on this call and we will build entire new campaigns based on that. It sounds like you guys are doing something similar. When you do your weekly pipe council, is that really based on generation? Is that on like quality controls? Is that on progression? All of the above. Um, so we had a really great motion for early indicators in our top of funnel pipeline metrics. But in the last year, we've extended it towards, um, you know, for, for us, it's stage two plus. But, you know, for other companies, it might be stage three plus or stage one plus. Uh, but really looking at how that's converting and pro progressing as well. And I think that's one of the things that's really important um, is to look at the holistic picture of what's happening in your business and your revenue, because you can look at one area and things can look great, right? You can look at demo requests on your website and like they're going up week over week. Everything looks awesome. It's great. Uh, but your real qualified pipeline isn't where it needs to be or your ACV isn't where it needs to be. You know, conversely, on the flip side, you can look at something and be like, oof, that's not looking great. Like our you know, if your marketing influence, your marketing source pipeline is down and you're only looking at your marketing influence pipeline, you might think, oh my gosh, you know, the sky is falling. But if you zoom out and you say, well, our AE source pipeline and our SDR source pipeline are overcompensating for that. And that pipeline is more likely to convert, more likely to close and have a higher sales price. Then maybe that's telling you something about your modeling. Um, and so I think that's why it's really important to, yes, not lose sight of the early indicators and top of funnel, but be tracking how that moves towards real qualified pipeline for your business. By the way, I love that. If I may just add, um, you know, I've seen this over and over again, where especially now when there's so much energy and attention on, hey, how much pipeline are we generating? You know, we've seen a lot of delayed decision and decision happening. So the natural reaction is, hey, let's have a lot more throughput at the top. I think quality matters a lot, a uh, lot more now than ever before. But this notion of, hey, who's sourcing what and where are you, what are the roles and responsibilities across the funnel and they're very much prescriptive, I don't think works, right? I think it's a component of it. I'm a big believer in swim lanes and I think it's a little bit of what you're articulating as well. 
Uh, and so there's a little bit of sort of shifting the the mindset of your revenue leadership across the entire engine and say, you know what, you all have to partner together. And pipeline councils are really interlock meetings allow for some of those same things. Because the moment that you put giant brick walls between these different teams is the moment that you are going to see some of the challenges that I think we've all started to see bubble up around that pipeline conversion, that pipeline maturity, that pipeline progression. Corinne, uh, earlier you mentioned 75 to 100 different portfolio companies. So obviously you've got a very broad kind of focus um, and oversight over all of those different organizations. What are the top three priorities that you're trying to push for for these companies right now? Yeah, great question. And you know, surprisingly, there's a lot of commonality, right? Uh, our companies are anywhere from business applications to healthcare to infrastructure. Their go-to-market engines all have some similar challenges. And, and the number one thing that I would just say, and maybe this is a little too high level, but I think historically growth has absolved a lot of sins within go-to-market, right? So there was a world that I was a, a guilty of it as well as a revenue operations leader where capacity solved all problems. Let me throw some more sellers in and higher coverage models and, 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 right? And that does naturally generate more revenue. We obviously can't do that the same way. We shouldn't have done that in the first place, right? Efficient growth, durable growth is more relevant. Um, a lot of VCs have sort of coached their, their portfolio companies to think that way. I think great portfolio companies were already thinking that way. Uh, and what's happening as a result is they are now looking at a little bit of a different altitude, more efficient altitude, certainly. And all those challenges start to pop up that we were perhaps ignoring previously. So the one thing that I would just to get really tangible, what I'm seeing a lot of now is that the best companies are thinking customer centric and customer first. So let's take a look at our go to market motion, which has historically been arguably insular, right? What are we doing for the customer? Turn it around. What is the customer's objective? What is it that they are trying to accomplish at a different phase and stage of the journey, whether it's during the learning phase, purchase phase, value realization phase, advocacy phase, there's so many different ways we engage with an end customer. So look at it from their perspective and then re-architect, reorganize your organization, your infrastructure, your processes to be reflective of that. It's a large initiative. It takes everybody coming together. I think revenue excellence needs to be at the tip of the spear for that too. Bring these teams, cross-functional groups together, help them rethink the paradigm with which they engage with the customer. And then everything else is almost like form factor. What systems you use, what processes you use. Those are the things that are, you almost don't want to over-govern. Every company can be a little bit different around it, although there are some best practices. So that's the main thing I've been sort of espousing and sharing with our portfolio companies, how to think about your go-to-market engine and how it now needs to change given um, really what I would argue is a best practice, which is being customer centric. Last question for both of you. Um, I'm sure some of our viewers out there are already on the road to a revenue ex excellence strategy or contemplating, um, you know, implementing some type of revenue excellence strategy or, or getting that motion going. What are the top two to three things that you would uh, say are absolutely crucial uh, before embarking on a, you know, a revenue excellence strategy? Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's, data, data, data. Um, yeah, that's probably one, two, and three. Um, but agreeing on what you were measuring, what is important to your business, using that to drive the focus for your teams, um, that's what it hinges on, right? That will drive the collaboration that you need to see, that will drive the measurement, that will allow you to pivot in real time and to see what's happening. And not just looking at what happened last year, but what's happening right now, what happened last week, what happened last month. Um, and then the second thing is even if you don't bring together all of the teams under one umbrella, we have a fairly unique setup at Clary for how we've done that. Um, and especially at larger companies, those could be established teams that roll up to different executives. But having the right collaboration model in place and incentivizing collaboration across those teams. You mentioned earlier, you don't want rigid swim lanes, right? You want to make sure that your enablement person is working with your mark product marketing person and working with your sales leader and that they're thinking about the whole picture and that everyone is thinking about the end goal of ACV for the company. And so, again, even if all of those functions roll up to different leaders, you can't bring them under one team, making sure that there's incentives to collaborate, right? That there's incentives to think about the whole and the company health and the sum of the parts more than my team, my metrics, my goals. 
So it's funny, we, we didn't compare notes before this, but a lot of the same things sort of come to mind for me. So data is absolutely top of mind. Collaboration is, I'll, I'll add one more. So anytime I have conversations with CROs and revenue leaders and ask them about what was that great initiative you did or ran that was transformational for your company, for your career, whatever it is. And I hear a slew of them. That's part of the job, right? I get to, get to, to listen and learn. And then I always ask them, well, what would you have done differently? if you got to do it again. And a hundred times out of a hundred, the same answer comes up. Man, I wish I'd spent more time aligning folks internally about what this is and what the desired outcome is and what the expectations are. Because you get to do that once, you don't get to keep going back with road shows and explaining to people what rev excellence is and could be. Uh, then you just have to show it after you first align, right? Um, and I think it's the same here. Um, Having the wherewithal to understand that a new function or relatively nascent function like a revenue excellence function is not a panacea. It will not cure everything. If your CRO and CMO are butting heads, adding this one new function ain't solving anything, right? Um, if they don't understand what this is meant to be, they will try to throw everything at it to try to solve for. Those aren't ideal outcomes. You set up yourself up to fail. You set the company up to fail without proper expectation. So in addition with all the things you mentioned, that would be the first thing I'd advocate really for any new function or any new initiative, but certainly for this one, which is so meaningful. Uh, take the time to articulate what it is that is being ring-fenced as expectations and focus for this function and how you need the partnership of your C-suite, of your revenue leaders to understand, to, to really drive success here because they are all involved. We are simply call it the form factor, the supporter, the guider, the quarterback, whatever you want to call it, to bring a broader constituency together. So I think start with that. And then from there, to your point, there's the, the, the bread and butter, as I like to call it, the data is really important. The, the interlock, the processes are really important. And then the rest is just, can you do it repeatably and consistently? If you can do that, then the answer will come in the first meeting. It won't come in the first month, but six months later, you'll realize you actually made a pivot to how the organization thinks. And that is where I think the answers in the room start to bubble up into something more meaningful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, Corinne. Thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate the time.